Thank you for joining us. Uh, our guest today is Stuart Patrick. He's Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and Director of the Program on International Institutions and Global Governance. Uh, before, before serving as a Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, he was at the, um, at the Center for Global Development, uh, another terrific organization. He was a, a research fellow there. And before that, he served under Colin Powell uh, on the, uh, in the State Department as a member of the policy plan staff. Um, and, and there he had responsibilities for our policy with respect to Afghanistan, but also uh, a variety of transnational dangers uh, that we'll be talking about a lot tonight. I should also note that he's the author of a really, really good book called The Sovereignty Wars, and um, he will be signing them, I think, if you uh, at the end of the program. So stay, stay for that. Um, I'm going to just start, Stuart, by asking you, first I, I want to mention that I was watching television last night, and uh, I was watching the news hour, and there was a woman, um, a, an American citizen who was on the show who said that she was hopeful about the future because um, other countries would not push us around anymore, um, and that we've been uh, really played by other countries for the past several decades, but now that's over, and things are going to be good. Um, and, and so I'm going to ask you pretty soon, after asking you a few other questions, what, what could make a citizen of the most powerful nation on earth feel pushed around, uh, feel that our country is pushed around. But first, I want you to first define sovereignty for us so that we know what it is that that citizen thought was at stake. Right, exactly. Thanks so much, Jane. And I want to thank the World Affairs Council of Northern California, which is such a marquee um, institution and, um, and, and a great asset to, to this city and all of uh, the entire state, of course. Um, uh, sovereignty, as I define it, is um, basically the universal principle of political order uh, the entire um, surface of the globe is divided up, except for Antarctica, into mm -hmm. things that we call states, which are um, basically the, 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 the principle of sovereignty declares that those states have supreme authority over a particular territory and its inhabitants, as well as the authority to control, although not necessarily the ability to control flows across um, those borders. So sovereignty is what separated the medieval age, Middle Ages uh, from modernity, and it has been the fundamental rule of uh, political organization for the last um, uh, really 350 plus years. Um, the difficulty in terms of sovereignty, uh, in terms of how we debate it and why it's so contentious is that sovereignty connotes a number of different uh, dimensions and those things, unless you clarify them, uh, the debates get heated extraordinarily fast because sovereignty has a, a, a connotation uh, that is a, akin to sort of motherhood and apple pie. And so you, if you say American sovereignty is being violated, suddenly everything erupts. And I, I'm happy to go into the, the three dimensions of sovereignty yes. that I cut, uh, com, uh, that, that I really identify. The first, and I, I want you to think in your mind's eye of, of, the, of a triangle, which I would call the sovereignty triangle. And like most triangles, this triangle has three corners. And the top <laughs> corner is, uh, is what I call authority. And that's, that's really the notion that that, that, that nothing is higher than the, the authority of that state. There, it doesn't answer, as the, uh, the old uh, Hebrew national hot dog commercials, when it does not answer to a higher authority, right? The, there's nothing above the United States, right? We don't do higher authority. So the Constitution reigns supreme. Another corner, I would say, is about freedom of action and autonomy. That is, are we Gulliver tied to the beach, or can we have freedom of maneuver? And then the third component of sovereignty, which is the third corner, which I think is really one that is coming more and more into play, is influence. And the question there is, what, how can we shape our own destiny? How do we influence our own destiny? When people are arguing about these different things, and I can come up with some examples, they're often talking about very different things. Now, you've written in your book that Americans have a particular attachment, that, it's got, that sovereignty's got a, a particular, I think, I think your phrase was emotional pull. Very much so. Why? What, is, what about our yeah. history that makes us feel that way? Yeah. Be the first to say that a lot of other countries around the world care about sovereignty. A lot of post-colonial countries care about it. But there are three, there are four things I, I, I would say that make the United States particularly sensitive. The first is really ideological. The United States was the first modern country founded on the principle of uh, popular sovereignty. That is, sovereignty did not reside in the king or the queen, nor even in the dynasty, nor even in some amorphous body politic. It resides in the people. And a people that is skeptical enough about delegating that on temporary or giving it on temporary loan to their own political leaders is even more skeptical about giving it 
to international organizations or international bodies. So that's one. The second is, is the well-worn view of American exceptionalism, which is a view that there's a myth, the, the, the myth that, we, that is so imbued in the American experiment that the United States has this indispensable role and, and, and not shared by any other country. And in, in fulfilling that role, we can sometimes go out and crusade to try to make the world a different place, or like us, or we st sit as a city on a hill, sort of as an example or a model or a beacon for humanity. But the one thing that is in common with American Exceptional, regardless of which way you go down, is that we have a lot to teach the rest of the world, and it doesn't have very much to teach us. So that also makes us guard our sovereignty. Mm -hmm. the, third, the third issue, I would say, is this, simply the separation of powers and the constitutional principle also of federalism. Both of those make it very hard for the United States to join international organizations and allow a few legislators who really care about sovereignty to block things like treaties. And then the final thing is really American power. Uh, the United States obviously was concerned about sovereignty when it was a very small country of a couple million, two, three million people on the Atlantic seaboard. But interestingly, while we gained in all this power and that made us embrace globalism after, particularly after the Second World War, it also gave us a lot more unilateral uh, options uh, than uh, other countries and more bilateral options. And you see Trump now favoring bilateralism on a lot of things. So all of those things conspire to make us both on the, it's, it's ambiguous because on the one hand, we are the greatest promoter of international rules of what has become known as the liberal international order. We, we've created and sponsored huge and defended huge numbers of international arrangements. And at the same time, we, we exempt ourselves from many of those. Uh, in not least treaties. Mm. And, and there's some pretty profound ways in which we ceded, ceded sovereignty, if you think back to the Genocide Convention Indeed. and uh, the, U the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and the concept of responsibility to protect. They, they all have the, uh, our rest on the assumption that we have interest in what happens inside, within states exactly. as well as among states. To what degree do we honor those or act on those commitments ourselves and do others? I mean, do, right. do the mechanisms yes. exist? What do you, you know, you, what you've, you've put your finger on a really interesting development in international law is that, of course, initially international law uh, was only among sovereign states. And in fact, sovereignty and mutual recognition of sovereignty is the basis for international law. But since the Second World War in particular and, the, and, the, and, and after the Nazi genocide, there has been a, 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 a flowering of international human rights law and humanitarian law, which recognizes, as you're saying, that citizens themselves count. What's interesting is that the United States, even, at, even though you know, n nobody in the United States was really for genocide, right? but it took four decades for us to ratify the Genocide Convention, partly um, because um, uh, during the 1940s and 1950s, a lot of segregationist senators w uh, were very opposed to UN conventions because they thought, "Wow, this could actually help break up segregation." Mm -hmm. And this, and so there's a there's an, and that's sort of been transformed into an argument about states' rights. But even at the height of our power, we we were quite ambivalent. In terms of, it's interesting. We, we can distinguish between sovereignty for us and sovereignty for others, uh, we, have, uh, we are much more protective of our own sovereignty than we are of the sovereignty of others. So, uh, and that is not lost on many countries in which the United States has intervened over the years for whatever justifications. But, um, but, but so the United States, interestingly, has been at the forefront of contingent sovereignty. And you reference the responsibility to protect, which is a principle that was endorsed by the entire United Nations by consensus in, uh, in 2005, which says that if a, a government commits atrocities or genocide against its own people, um, then the responsibility to protect them devolves to their international community because that's beyond the pale. Um, we've also been at the forefront of contingent sovereignty with respect to countries pursuing WMD against their, uh, or, or terrorists, sponsoring terrorism. So it's a, there's, a, there's a sovereignty for us, but not necessarily for others' aspect in, in the way we look at things. So when it comes to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, first place, there was opposition to that. Wasn't there an amendment in the Senate uh, later? Yes, well, there was, yeah, the, 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 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is interesting because it, it's, in a sense, a non-binding treaty. Um, the, but you're absolutely right. And the amendment that, that I was sort of hinting around is called the Bricker Amendment, yeah, right. which came out in the Senator John Bricker of Ohio, a, a Republican, uh, was 
trying to, again, looked at the landscape of UN treaties and it was a, and was very, very conservative nationalist sovereigntist and said, look, we cannot have the UN creating these bodies that will, in a, in a sense, in their view, tell us what to do. I, and I think that fear remains the case and there are the, there's a sovereignty caucus uh, in US Congress that has as one of its avowed desires to get the United States out of the United Nations and the United Nations out of the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I mean, if you look at the, U at the Universal Declaration, I mean, there's, it's got social and economic rights, exactly. including the right to education, the right to, to health, uh, the right to various social services. Would we pass, would we, would we agree to the UN Declaration today? Uh, I don't think we would actually. Um, it, it could depend on which administration uh, uh, were in power, uh, perhaps under the Obama administration. Um, and there was some, you know, in our in negotiations, for instance, in, at the Human Rights Council, which the, uh, the George W. Bush administration had not decided not to join. Under the Obama administration, there was, an, there was an effort to sort of push some rights that conservatives were more skeptical of. I think to, 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 to juxtapose two conventions, one we've signed up to and the one we haven't. We have signed up to the UN Convention on Civil and Political Rights, but we are not parties to the UN Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And part of that has to do with an ideological um, aspect of American politics, and that, or American political culture, really. We tend to, in our constitutional tradition, favor or uniformly favor Negative, what negative rights. In other words, taking restraints off of your ability to peacefully assemble or to worship your own deity, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to giving folks rights uh, or acknowledging rights to shelter or to food, etc., many of the things that perhaps many of us in the room think should be rights, the constitutional basis for that is much less, and those are still very contested uh, within the U.S. political system. So when it comes to, for example, the Convention on Genocide, we're not acting, as far as I know, when it comes to the Rohingya. The, the UN is providing right, exactly. uh, humanitarian assistance, but I'm talking about just sort of taking a political stand. What's happening? Well, they, you know, um, Nikki Haley at the uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations has um, uh, talked about the plight of the Rohingya um, uh, relatively frequently. Um, she has and, and has, has it has largely um, framed it, I believe, as part of uh, the, the, the fact that the United States stands for sort of humanitarian relief, et cetera. But there has been very little move on the part of this administration to uh, suggest that there should be uh, any defense of the Rohingya rights uh, as, uh, in, in terms of defending them against what the um, UN Human Rights Chief uh, and indeed the Secretary General Antonio Guterres has described as, as acts of genocide or acts of uh, crimes against humanity. And I think that actually goes to a big part of the um, Trump administration's foreign policy that is not divorced from the sovereignty debate, which is basically a willingness to turn a blind eye towards uh, democratic, uh, you know, infringements on democracy and, uh, and, and also violations of human rights. It's, it's rather extraordinary to me the degree to which this administration has been silent on human rights and democracy. You know, if there's one thing that's united Democrats and Republicans by and large, administrations, and, and sometimes they've acted on it, sometimes they haven't, is the notion that democracy is the best way to organize oneself and, and uh, individual human rights and fundamental human rights are actually things that we should, uh, we should defend. Now, obviously, we've made exceptions to that. <laughs> we've been hypocritical at times. But to not make it a pillar of American foreign policy strikes me as a huge deviation from historical past. And then when it comes to, I mean, I just want to zero in for a moment on just the practicalities of, of these agreements. When it comes to responsibility to protect, we, we invoked that, I believe, when it came to Libya. Indeed. And that certainly was yeah, our logic. Yeah, 2011, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then, and then but, but not in Syria. Uh, what were the practical, what were the differences between those two crises that, that produced those d distinct Dist responses? Distinct responses. Exactly. Um, the responsibility to protect, as the Libya case shows, is not um, a it, it, its application is less straightforward than its um, normative appeal, right? In, in the case of because um, it raises questions of what is the threshold of evil that must be reached, how many atrocities trigger this, under what authority is the intervention launched, and what are the responsibilities of the intervening powers? In this case, 
Um, the Security Council did uh, authorize, after uh, particularly um, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton noted that some of the statements that um, Muammar Gaddafi was making could result in the, th the slaughter of thousands of um, Libyans civ and civilians, unarmed civilians, uh, because of the statements that he was making. And so that used that to get a, um, in a sense, a humanitarian intervention authorized uh, on the part of, uh, by, by NATO and uh, with some additions of the Arab League and others. Now, um, very quickly, um, the Chinese and the Russians um, came to the conclusion, and some African countries as well, the, the AU as a bloc, came to the conclusion that the United States and its Western allies had, had used this as an excuse for regime change. And not only that, they, they didn't do a very good job, we didn't do a very good job in the aftermath of the Libyan um, uh, intervention, so it sort of became this sort of um, chaotic, chaotic zone, not quite Somalia, but verging towards. And so there was a lot of buyer's remorse on their part, and they used that as an excuse for blocking um, any other Security Council, uh, any s strong Security Council authorization in the case of Libya, I mean in the case of Syria. Now whether or not that was just a convenient, um, you know, uh, you know, arrow in their, you know, argumentative quiver to be able to, to be able to shut down something they wanted to anyway, particularly the Russians because they're so closely uh, affiliated with the, with the regime of Bashar al-Assad. But be that as it may, there's a lot of sort of buyer's remorse about this because uh, you know, and, and to try to get around that, I should just, I'll, I'll stop with this, that, that the Brazilians um, even came up with a concept of responsibility while protecting. In other words, it's incumbent upon the interveners to then go back to the Security Council and say, look, um, here's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Do you, do you continue to approve this? What happens with these Security Council resolutions is often is that they're approved, but then if something goes sideways, the resolution still stands and, can, and, and, and it, there's no sort of monitoring and evaluation and accountability as, as we go forward. What's striking is if, if you look at, at modern history is the degree to which uh, we, kind of, we criticize the UN, we malign the UN, but we, always, we usually turn to them for at least the patina of you know, some, some kind of approval that gives some legitimacy to that action. And you, yeah, yeah, you certainly saw that. I, I certainly saw that. In I mean, I, I was a, I was a fellow uh, working for the policy planning staff at the State Department. And I stayed on as sort of a non-political uh, experts position there. Um, so I was there for about two and a half years, and I was there at a time when there was grave skepticism uh, within the Bush administration about um, about the United Nations. And yet, what was striking was even bef by the end of the first term of the Bush administration, when it had been, in, in a sense to its critics, it's most unilateral. The, the administration came back again and again yeah. and, you know, to help organize the elections. You know, Sergio Vieira de Mello came in as a special representative and, uh, alas, paid with his life in the Baghdad bombing. Um, they, they, and, and, you know, they came back later in the second term to try to deal with the peacekeeping uh, uh, effort in Lebanon after the Israeli um, intervention there. So uh, I think, you know, the UN is, a, is really easy to... Um, use as a scapegoat. And I think uh, Richard Holbrook always made the really interesting point or really valid point that, you know, blaming the UN uh, for, for its failures was sometimes like blaming uh, Madison Square Garden when the Knicks did really badly. Because, <laughs> because, because, because frankly, you know, the, the UN is its member states. Some dysfunctionality is built into the system, right? The veto which the United States would never have stayed in, wouldn't, we wouldn't even have joined if, unless that had a veto. Well, the veto is a pain in the butt when it comes to, uh, you know, the Chinese and the Russians, you know, casting it or threatening to. And there's a lot of pocket vetoes, so some things never even get, you know, voted on because they know that it's not going to happen. Um, the other thing that I think that critics, a lot of critics of the UN tend to, and it's, again, it is a, it is a organization with major, major flaws and different corners that are full of cronyism, et cetera, and, and inefficiency. But other parts of it are actually do the, do the Lord's work, and I don't know if I can say that in a secular sense as well, but I mean, do just tremendous work. But, um, but its dimensions are often exaggerated. You know, the, 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 the regular budget of the United Nations, this is regular budget, not including peacekeeping and some voluntary contributions, is only a little bit larger than the average annual advocacy budget or lobbying budget at the National Rifle Association, okay? And it's only a little bit larger than um, the budget of the New York City Police Department, right? This is not some huge behemoth global government, but it, it doesn't necessarily have a huge built-in constituency in the United States, so it's really easy to tar with failures that are often more properly left at 
its member states, at the right. doors of its member states. Well, the most recent is, is a, a, a threat to, to withhold funding, in particular for the Palestinian uh, refugees, um, as a, in retaliation for a vote that didn't go our way. Exactly, um, and I think that, <laughs> if I may, that, that you know, it was it sovereignty came up in that because you know um, uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley, but in in an in an effort that I thought she and the president were both sort of bullying and browbeating, hectoring that was not going to go over well because once you sort of say we're taking names, then you make it impossible for a, a representative that has any domestic political constituency that doesn't want to see you kowtowing to the United States to actually vote with you. So it's not even on its own terms; it's not particularly effective. But she was making the point that we have a sovereign right to move our embassy to where another sovereign government says it should be. And my argument to that was, yes, you have a sovereign right to do it. It doesn't make it the smart thing to do if you're going to prejudge uh, final status outcome within, within right. the, the... So let's talk about that period during which, I mean, the immediate post-war period when there was this burst of innovation. I mean, you've got... You know, the UN, you have general agreements on, on tariffs and trade, you've got uh, the Marshall Plan, NATO, uh, the, the predecessor to the, the precursor to the European Union. What was the, the, what was the underlying concept behind it? I think back in your book to your quote of the president of Harvard and his notion of fencing in as opposed to fencing out. You right. may want to refer to that. Mm -hmm. But I think in many ways it creates the metaphor for the way we were thinking about sort of integrating or embedding former enemies uh, in a larger shared order. A absolutely. Um, and it was, I think it was an act of enlightened self-interest. And it was based on uh, a, a, a real sense that the United States could not simply afford to pursue transactional goals, sort of what's in it for me in a narrow national security or national interest or, 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 um, or economic sense. Sort of the language that one hears, frankly, a lot from, um, from the president himself, um, that as if, as if diplomacy or inter international interaction were a one-shot game. And that's, it strikes me that sometimes the president sort of treats diplomacy as if it's a, a, a collection of real estate deals that you're doing. And, and provided you can always go find another buyer, that's fine, or another seller. But if you're actually dealing with the same countries over and over again, um, it, 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 I think you have to, have to invest in the system. And, and, and I think that, you know, the, the, you, one can overdo the greatest generation aspect of things, but when you look at the giants of the of the post-war period, uh, the Atchison's, uh, Marshall's, uh, uh, Truman, um, uh, FDR, but then also their Republican counterparts uh, like Arthur Vandenberg, they recognized that pursuing milieu goals, in other words, investing in the system was very important. Um, and, and partly it was just to, to, you referenced the president of Harvard um, University, um, Part of it was in reference, to, part of it was in reaction to the lessons of the interwar period where the United States had experienced the most cataclysmic, and the world had, the most cataclysmic um, uh, depression in modern times, followed by the world's descent into the world, into the still the most uh, destructive, just cataclysmic um, uh, global confrontation. And so the question was, how could we build something different? Now, they had had that debate after the First World War, too. And the, my book begins with this vignette of a debate, famous debate, uh, between A. Lawrence Lowell, who's the president of Harvard University, and Senator Henry Cabot Lodge about whether or not the United States should join the League of Nations. And it's sort of topical, I mean, in a weird way now, because, you know, we just passed the anniversary of, of 100th anniversary of Woodrow Wilson unveiling the 14 points, mm -hmm. and we're coming up on the centenary of this debate next spring. And what was interesting was, was what Lowell says uh, is that it's, it's, it, it's not enough to, in a sense, wrap yourself behind m or, or insulate yourself behind moats or behind walls. And, um, and, and that what we really need to do, it, it, it's a mistake to, you know, what Washington's doctrine about no permanent alliances and Jefferson's a admonition about no entangling um, alliances were fine for their time, but it's not going to be too long before zeppelins will carry bombs across you know vast oceans. You know, it, it just ended up not being the zeppelins, but more, more, but more, but more you know major airplanes, and now it's rockets. And and I think that there was a recognition of global interdependence that has only made some of that rationale um, uh, more uh, more important. Yeah. There's something about, you know, if you want to protect the orchard on your side with oh, yes, the fence, that's, right, that's, that's one right. goal. But <laughs> that's right. He said, he, said that, he said at one point, he said, um, you know, um, uh, at one point, Henry Cavalage says, you know, you, you say that, you know, 
by joining the League of Nations, you're not going to tear down, you know, you're not going to tear down the Monroe Doctrine. But wait a second, you're going to make it impossible for us to keep this little area over here that's never bothered anybody, in a sense. Um, and um, and then um, uh, Lowell says, well, that's all very well if, if your only goal is to protect that orchard, but if you want to make the fence bigger and, prote and, and prote protect more orchards. Um, again, you know, a lot of fall flaws with the League of Nations, but the idea behind the League of Nations would be, was sort of a forerunner to the United Nations that there would be a global universal system of international peace and security that would at least provide a measure of uh, comfort against um, against uh, just uh, un, un, unencumbered aggression, yeah. I guess. I mean, a lot of, as you think about foreign policy, there's, there's so much that we do that's about isolating a state like North Korea or the Soviet Union during our policy of containment, and so much that's all about integration. Indeed about you know, this, this notion of embedding, uh, embedding people in a larger countries and a larger order so that there is, uh, you've got more in common than in conflict. You've got a, a shared, a shared uh, investment in the, in the system. And of course, globalization has pushed that even farther. And right, exactly. <laughs> and you have globalization, which is you know, a, a phenomenon that has upsides and downsides. And so of course, in a, in a, in a system that's composed of sovereign states and there's no, there's no trajectory, at least immediately or even the medium term, to go to another f form of political organization. But you do have this juxtaposition of, of, you know, sovereign jurisdictions on the one hand, and a global system of interaction and data flow and economic exchange and financial transfers and and also the downsides of of, of you know disease and uh, uh, climate change and uh, and transnational terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. So you have how do you navigate the the natural desire for autonomy and independence in a world where you increasingly need to actually uh, try to handle these things together because there's no way you can handle them separately. And so many times the sort of freedom of action that uh, hardcore sovereigntists push for is unrealistic because it would either force you to do everything on your own or uh, and, and, and bear all that burden or try to do everything on your own and fail miserably. So as I think about my lady on TV, her concern should not be so much the UN as it is the process of globalization, the reality that we can't defend against a good deal. Right, exactly. Uh, on our own. Right, and I think, so, yes, go ahead, I'm sorry. So we'll talk about how we're trying to do it right now. I mean, as you look at the range of issues that you know, sovereignty doesn't kind of help you figure out how to deal with climate change, right? It's, right. it's insufficient as a unit of analysis, and, and you know the same is true with infectious diseases or terrorism or cybersecurity. Um, as you take a look at the choices that we are taking right now, in the aggregate, are you able to kind of draw conclusions about what we think our role in the world should be. I mean, let me just, I'll, I'll just run through some for you. Uh, arms control, which is a pretty traditional mm -hmm. approach. Uh, the president has said with the, uh, the, the nuclear deal with Iran, he has said to our co-signators, to the Europeans, you have to negotiate a better deal or I'm walking out. Right, exactly. I'm slapping on sanctions. W what, is, what are his assumptions about sovereignty and about diplomacy when he comes up with that as a response, or put differently, what are they hearing when yes, they hear that? Yes, I, well, I think that, you know, what they're, I just think it's self-defeating. Um, it, it's a self-defeating sovereignty obsession because, um, first of all, it exaggerates the leverage that the United States has in the world today. Um, and you see this in, in, you know, pulling, first of all, his invocation of sovereignty is very stylized and really uh, inaccurate. Uh, just take climate change, for instance, and, and, and it's also an example of why uh, the United States is not the only game in town anymore. Um, when he made his Rose Garden speech, uh, as he had for several other uh, issues like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and another, others, he actually invoked sovereignty in about three, um, three different paragraphs, I mean, three whole paragraphs basically talking about how the, the Paris Accord was a violation of American sovereignty, um, which was it's a total red herring because, you know, it's a largely aspirational document which was based on independent, nationally determined contributions, these INDCs, that basically all countries were going to come to the table and say, here's how we're going to actually deal with this problem. 
it, it was the, the farthest from an infringement on sovereignty as you can imagine an international agreement being and still have it being an agreement. And, so, and yet that did not stop him from saying, well, it was, we all know even informal agreements end up becoming binding over time, right? Or, or becoming, you know, more formalized over time. But, but, so, but what was interesting in the aftermath, of course, was, you know, immediately everybody said, everybody else said, we're still in, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we, we are, you know, not only that, we're just, we're doubling down. And, and so, uh, you know, the EU and the Chinese immediately released a, a statement to that effect. And then interestingly, um, because this issue is one that is not necessarily something that is really the pro province of states, it's often the pro province of cities, right, which are some of the major contributors to greenhouse gases, then, then you have, um, you know, uh, Michael Bloomberg and his um, pals and contemporaries around the world, former and current mayors uh, of major cities um, having the C40 coalition. And then you have heads of corporations, et cetera, basically saying full steam ahead. And, and then you have Jerry Brown immediately during that time uh, heading off and being treated practically as a head of state, you know, befitting the sixth, sixth perhaps largest economy in the world, you know, in, in Beijing and, um, and, and talking about green technology and what, what can we do with the Chinese. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, there are just some mistaken assumptions. You see this with um, the JCPOA, the Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action with respect to Iran. There's this notion that, well, just go get a better deal. And yet, you know, it, it were we to renege on it, the diplomatic fallout with at least three of our closest allies, um, uh, the Germans, uh, the French, and uh, the Brits would be um, would be pretty strong. You also see countries in in the trade sphere when we we went out of TPP, right? Well, the the remaining eleven decided that we're going to keep on moving ahead. I think in the hopes eventually that the United States, in their view, regains its sanity. So, so your your comment on on the climate accord. It, it, brings me to, to a different topic, and that is who are the actors? Where are the solutions coming from? Is this just about states? In each of these transnational issues, okay. is it, you know, are, there, are the sole actors uh, sovereign governments? Right, I, and you know, it's interesting, uh, increasingly not only, I mean, I, let me state first that um, the sovereign state remains vital in both senses of that word. It remains uh, important and it's in a sense foundational and it also remains vigorous. Um, the nation state has been, or the state has been a handmaiden of globalization. It's often, we often see them simply as, as oppositionally, but the reason, but the global economy did not occur by magic, right? Uh, it occurred in part because states, uh, political leaders around the world thought it was their, in their interest to foster this sort of uh, uh, an international system of trade. That being said, um, non uh, both civil society actors and private corporations are increasingly involved in all sorts of um, in all sorts of solutions. You see it in in Gavi, the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunization. You see it in the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, which in which the Gates Foundation is an equal player with uh, sovereign states uh, as well as the, uh, the WHO in that issue. Um, so, increasing uh, you know, uh, internet governance is one that at least so far remains strongly um, multi-stakeholder in terms of the model that it has. At the level of negotiation and agreement, uh, that tends to still be a, a province of states, although non-governmental uh, organizations and advocacy groups will often provide the equivalent of, you know, amicus briefs for particular, to particular governments that might need a little bit of technical assistance, but to push things in their direction. Yeah. Um, one of the questioners um, asks about the standards by which um, we, w the standards we apply, the, the international system applies when, uh, when, when groups uh, want, wish to become states. Um, what, what he's referring to is the, state, is the case of the Kurds. Here we are, champions of, of the whole notion of autonomy. We see it as, as a, a, a fundamental right in many ways. And yet, uh, when the Kurds are seeking autonomy, we are um, signaling that we're not with them on that. What's the thinking? Right. I mean, this is this issue of which is related to the concept of, of sovereignty and not least popular sovereignty. This is the issue of national self determination and or political self determination. But often, and that is that is viewed through the lens of of sort of a nation that that um, you know some a nation is an imagined community of people that believe that they all belong to something and that they deserve their own state right and um, it is one of national self-determination is one of those vexing problems that the international community has had to deal with and it, it's it's for most profound champion as with the League of Nations was Woodrow Wilson and uh, and 
his, but his secretary of, uh, of state, uh, Lansing, said, whoa, that this word was, phrase was ever uttered. It's loaded with dynamite because, of course, what happened at the Paris Peace Conference was some nationalities had their uh, aspirations dignified and others, uh, the Kurds being some of them, the Ruthenians being another, did not have them. But the Kurds stand out as one of the largest ethnic groups, in a sense, uh, ethnic cul cultural groups that has not been dignified by that. Now, the international community, I'm not an international lawyer, but my understanding is the international community does not have, and the UN system does not have a, a particularly well-defined um, way of, or, or uh, procedure for adjudicating um, these cases or sort of deciding who it, it is in, in, in effect um, eligible for statehood. Um, much, much of the time it depends on whether or not there are any provisions within whatever constitution exists in those countries. This is a problem also as we're seeing now for the Catalans, of course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, occasionally there are peaceful divorces, right? Um, Czechoslovakia, right? There's now a Czech Republic and a Slovak Republic. Um, but more often than not, and, and, I mean, and there, it has been through war, like Eritrea, Eritrea and Ethiopia, um, uh, Sudan, South Sudan. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't have a silver bullet on, on, on that question about the Kurds. It, 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 mostly it ha it ha it, it's about well, the, how the great powers respond to it. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Do we need a silver bullet? That is to say, does, does the UN need a, a set of standards that a, an individual uh, country would need to meet for the rest of us to then, to then uh, acknowledge and uh, treat that as a legitimate con country? I, I think it... A, a set of standards and principles, uh, and including about the treatment of minorities within those yeah. countries, would of course be useful. I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, it, it would have to go, and, and of course it probably would have to pass Security Council muster in addition. But again, it's work, it, working out the procedures would be very complicated. The problem of cybersecurity okay, yeah. um, is a big one. We have a tendency uh, to to approach, whenever we have the technological advantage, we're not keen on having that advantage of being, we're not keen about being uh, constrained in any way. And certainly that was the case during the beginning of the nuclear age. We weren't enthusiastic about arms control until it became clear that we wouldn't be the only game in town. Um, now with cyber, we had the advantage uh, at first. There wasn't great enthusiasm for coming up with, with new norms for uh, the conditions under which you could, uh, could launch a cyber attack of some sort. Turns out we're not the only game in town anymore. What are we doing right now to uh, establish new regimes, a new regime for dealing with the question of cyber? I, I think it's absolutely right that there there wasn't there hasn't been much incentive until until now since we obviously we were on uh, at least um, uh, some people have acknowledged that we were on the receiving end of quite um, a malicious attack on, uh, on the part of the Russian government um, or Russian sponsored um, hackers uh, in in our in our 2016 election. Um, there are. I do not think you are going to see a single regime, that's what the term of art that people talk about, for a single framework for governance of a particular, international governance, intergovernmental um, regulation of a particular sphere. F I don't think you're gonna see a single, one coherent effort within the cyber, within cyberspace. I think what you're gonna see is um, what I call global governance in pieces, which is you bite off certain chunks of it. Um, one, one, uh, promising, one of the few promising moves was a, an agreement uh, during the Obama administration between uh, China and the United States with respect to um, cyber espionage, or excuse me, um, yeah, cyber, not cyber espionage, but, uh, but basically stealing intellectual property, um, commercial espionage, I should say. And, you know, having some sort of um, regulations about that, and then one could imagine sort of like we do with something called the Financial Action Task Force, where we give, the, it, it's a body that gives different jurisdictions a seal of, you know, a seal of approval for that, and it, that they've met certain standards in terms of anti-money laundering. One could imagine something similar happening in the realm of commercial espionage. There is there there are ongoing talks about the degree to which the laws of war should apply to um, to cyber conflict and and uh, and what would should be permissible in peacetime and what should be permissible uh, during war. Things like not attacking root servers or not attacking critical infrastructure that might cause civilian deaths and be a violation of international humanitarian law, etc. Um, and but there and there are a lot of ideological differences though that are going on. Um, one of them has to do with how you define cybersecurity. For the Russians and the Chinese, 
defining cybersecurity, particularly for the Chinese, uh, they, they talk about it in terms of information security. And largely that is, does the government basically control the m means in which people spread things around? Now we, uh, having a tradition of, um, of more ind individual liberty, w that we would chafe at that, right? On the other hand, we've done a certain amount of bulk data collection uh, around the world, and there are other countries that would like to have rules about that. So it's a it's an ungoverned mess right now, um, and uh, and and even even issues that divide there are even issues major issues that divide uh, us uh, across the tra transatlantically between our, some of our closest allies in terms of how much personal information digital information can be where can it be stored uh, and um, and how much of it can be shared with say private corporations that are apparently know a lot about what we're doing. <laughs> so North Korea. Um, it turned out we used uh, cyber attacks against against them to try to uh, ensure that their missile missile launches didn't work so well. Allegedly, uh, allegedly we did. And um, but now we're learning, of course, that North Korea is pretty good at cyber attacks That's itself. Right. Yes. Um, talk about that aspect of the relationship with the North, but then let's move on to conversation about their nuclear program. Right. Sure. Uh, I would say that. Um, you know, one of the problems there, I guess I, I, I'm not a huge expert on, on their, their cyber capabilities, to say the least, but I, I would say that one of the difficulties um, has to do with um, the attribution problem in terms of cyber attacks is absolutely huge. And uh, because, and this has come out in our relationship with the Chinese and, and the Russians as well, is attacks can be en emanating from the sovereign territory of another country. Does that mean that... Um, the government in charge was the one that was commanding it, and also, um, and if even if it wasn't, is there some sovereign liability that that uh, jurisdiction has? Now, I'm pretty sure, given um, the relatively uh, small uh, portion of the uh, North Korean state that could be described as civil society, that um, independent civil society, that is, that these were coming from obviously from uh, from the North Korean state themselves. Uh, the question is, what is the what is the re retaliation? And my my sense is that there have been, you know, and how how broad based does does that retaliation become? Um, my sense so far is, in addition to squeezing, you know, the economic lifeblood of the North Korean regime, not just for the cyber attacks, but also for the nuclear program, um, in terms of you know exports of coal um, and uh, and other and imp perhaps imports as well. Um, there's an effort to target some of the senior regime officials who are probably pretty good at squirreling away um, whatever hard uh, resources or, or, or riches that they have managed to amass through all sorts of things. I mean, they're basic, they're like a, they're, they're basically a soprano state. They, you know, anything that's illicit and illegal, those guys try to, try to make money with it from methamphetamines to counterfeit currency. So there's a big effort to try to deal with that. But you wanted to talk also about the nuclear program, is well, that right? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you take a look, we were talking a lot about the relationship between the Trump administration and its point of view and, and the UN. And sure. in fact, a, a, they were tremendously successful when it came to ratcheting up the, uh, the sanctions against North Korea. Indeed. Got a unanimous vote in the Security Council. The Chinese were on side. Um, are we doing are we doing the right thing when it comes to North Korea? Have we been following a smart strategy? I think that um, I think that the there are some who argue that the major provocations and provocative statements that the president have made have been, you know, helpful in perhaps creating this madman theory of uh, you know that 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 you know that. And, you know, People used to talk about Nixon in that regard too, as well. That that somehow this puts the pressure on, and maybe that's why the North is talking to the South, and why they're going to, you know, participate in the, you know, Olympic Games uh, together. My my sense is that um, there's a real danger that the United, the United States, by being appearing reckless and provocative, uh, will actually help drive a wedge between. Uh, the, and this is what they hope that 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 will may drive a wedge between us and and the South Koreans. You know, the South Korean government, I think, is is interested in more negotiations. A lot of people think that the charm offensive that the North Koreans have launched is yet another attempt to kick the can down the road while continuing to work on its uh, its nuclear program. I think there need you know the the there may be more avenues for the United States to talk face to face with the North Koreans with fewer preconditions. That's my view, but 
again, I'm not an expert on uh, North Korea, and I know that it's befuddled and, uh, you know, yep. administrations of both stripes yeah. <laughs> and all yeah. sorts of stripes for about the last 25 years. But I will say that, that, that w with respect to the Iranian nuclear uh, agreement, one of the major um, reasons not to uh, tear up that agreement is because then what is the credibility of any agreement that you sign with the North Koreans if you tear up the Iranian one uh, when they appear to be doing what they said they were going to do? Yeah. This, this question card actually could have, could, I could have asked this right before that answer, and that is, are there areas where the Trump administration has caused you to rethink your views, um, finding him to be correct when you didn't think he was at first? Um, you know, what's interesting is, is I think I have a little bit more sympathy for um, some of the uh, efforts to try to get the Western allies and even some of, the, some of the Asian allies to actually pony up more for their own defense. Not in the sense of, which I think is bad, very badly framed and, 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 and boorish, this notion that somehow you guys owe us money, which is not the way alliances work, that's not the way NATO works, etc. But there have been burden, regular burden-sharing debates since the foundation of NATO in 1949, and there are reasonable questions to ask as to why the United States should bear the lion's share of the burden of Western defense when some of those countries are, as you might have seen if you have gone and traveled there, <laughs> doing just fine, thank you, in terms of their per capita income. And so I think that there's a, there's a reasonable case to be made there. And there is, you know, some people have made the argument to me, well, look, since he's said that, you know, the Europeans have agreed to increase their defense spending by 4.3 percent. And, um, and, but also be careful what you watch out for. Be careful what you want, too, because they're also increasing EU independent capabilities, uh, uh, independent from NATO, that is, to actually defend themselves. So, um, you know, that, and that creates a little bit more uncertainty. Obviously, we're still going to remain allies with them, but there's a certain level of control or influence that we have because of the supreme allied commander in Europe. And, you know, if we remove that, we're not going to be rivals with the Europeans, but our, our leverage will be less. Talk a little bit about our approach to migration. You yes. referenced it earlier. Um, when I think about our country and, and what it is, you know, we, it's, we, we don't all have the same ethnic background. We are not all the same faith, and we're, uh, we don't even all speak the same language. Right? What we have in common is a set of values, and a big piece of that is a commitment to pluralism. Is that commitment, that a commitment appears to be on the wane, what are the conditions that take us there, um, that, that move us away from that core value, and how is it playing out in the migration, immigration debate? Yes, there's a there's a chapter in the book um, uh, that is um, is called "Good Fences Make Good Neighbors," and it's just a, obviously the play on the Robert Frost um, poem. But um, but it basically is looking at um, borders and uh, immigration. And I think that you're right that our founding myth, and I, I, I don't mean myth to totally dismiss it, but but to suggest that it's it, that in reality has not always been true in, in practice. Right? Is that the United States um, is an idea nation, not a people nation. Uh, that it, it, we are an open community, a, a community that is open, at least in principle, to all peoples who would uh, embrace the principles embodied in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and related documents and traditions, right? So that is the thought. Obviously, uh, whereas other countries have always been seen, often been seen to be more blood and soil um, uh, countries where, you know, it would be hard to imagine an immigrant going there and actually becoming truly seen as that nationality. In reality, of course, it's been much more complicated than that, and there have been repeated bouts of uh, anti-immigrant, uh, obviously lots of, you know, I don't have to talk about the history of Ameri uh, racism towards African Americans, much less slavery, but, but and, and Native Americans, but, but bouts of anti-immigrant sentiment um, directed at particular groups from the get-go who appeared to perhaps be a threat to either the more dominant culture or we're going to upset status hierarchies in the country, right? And it is no surprise that some of these things are coming to fruition now after we have had one of the peaks of um, Im immigration, one of, the, one of the highest, the highest levels of foreign-born Americans, right? And 
I think there, yes, there, there's a lot of ugliness that goes with that. There's also, there are also sort of more practical questions of, wow, at what pace do, can the United States assimilate um, uh, num in numbers of people? So, but there, and there's sort of reasonable debates about like what is the right immigration level, et cetera. But there's a lot of ugliness, obviously, that has been uh, er erupted around that. And because the concept of popular sovereignty, which is what we're based on, it raises the question, well, who is the people, right? And in the past, the, the, at least the myth is that the people are the people who say, I believe in these values and, and therefore I embrace them and that's why we swear your allegiance, right? But what we've also seen are some uglier definitions of what people consider the people to be and some, some who are not. And, and um, so I think that's, that really is playing out a little bit uh, in the immigration debate and there's a lots, lots of, you know, a lot of the folks who are really against immigration. And I, what I think is, because it's not just illegal immigration. I mean, this administration wants to drastically curtail legal immigration, and it wants to get away from this sort of immigration that started in the 1960s, which was, in 1970s, which was for, to far more diverse array of countries. Um, and I think for some of the base, some of the Trump base, I think there's real alarm at being a minority white country, right? And... I'll just go out and say that. I just think that that's the case, I, and I, and I think you know, hopefully over time that will that will be diminished. Um, but in certain corners of the country, it's pretty strong. No, there's a sense among among many that there's a clear anti-Muslim bent, and in, in part it's because of the 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 decision to try to ban. Uh, immigrants from uh, and and refugees from Muslim majority countries, but it's also such things as you know, tweeting out a uh, pretty unpleasant uh, kind of a, a attack on the on the mayor of London right after there was a terror attack, and right, he happens sure. to be Muslim. And if you sort of add up the various statements made, and in particular in tweets, you come away you can come away with that impression. There are those who argue that that creates the very danger. Um, that many Americans fear, that in fact, that, that you are in essence creating a, an enemy by being so disrespectful, by robbing that, that set of, of people of, of dignity. Is there anything to that in your view? I, certainly, I think that it's very dangerous. I think it's playing with fire. I think it's, um, it's pitting us against one another in groups on the basis of certain characteristics that they have that doesn't judge them. It's, it's fundamentally un-American because you're not you're, first of all, you're, you're wildly stereotyping particular groups of people on the basis of the actions often of a very small number. You're pitting them against each other without any uh, chance to actually find out how much commonality as, yeah, and you're denying their common humanity. And, and in a way, you're also denying your own ability to actually grow. So all in all, not a great strategy. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that... Um, you know, I, I mean, it's it's just appealing to not the better angels of our nature, but appealing to the things that that divide us and and that make us petty and make us look for scapegoats. And I just think that um, it's uh, unconscionable. So to achieve most of our goals internationally, and as you think about the the number of issues that are transnational in nature, but even the the traditional great power relations, uh, et cetera. We have to show some level of leadership, right? Uh, we have to we have to show up. Um, are we, as as some argue, are we forfeiting that role? Are we choosing the kind of? I think Fareed Zakaria has said we're resigning from the role as a, as a global leader. Yes. Do you feel we're doing so? And if so, is that leadership role something that can be regained? After t over time, or should it be something different yes. anyway? Should it be a more collaborative kind of leadership? Yeah, I think you know, there for the longest, it, it, it's it's really the big question right now. And I, you know, and uh, my uh, boss Richard Haas has written um, about the abdication of American leadership, and um, you know, during the during the uh, Bush administration, that in the transition to the Obama administration, there's quite a bit of um, criticism about the Obama administration rather than leading from the front actually leading from behind, and I'm not sure who came up with this phrase. It could have been somebody in the New York Times op-ed um, uh, department, I think, but, uh, but that, that, that under Trump, we were, we were leading, leaving from behind, right? So that we were sort of leaving, we were ceding the field to others. And there's a, there are a number of problems with that. One of them is, 
that um, uh, is that that leaves the the place open for others and sometimes that's good right because I think that you know there's been this question of for a long time the United States, I mean the world needs one leader and there's even a theory in you know international political economy called hegemonic stability theory which just basically means that you need to have one leader at any one time to do all these services well maybe not right I mean maybe you could have something more like a concert uh, or, or or different countries take the lead on particular issues but that's always been seen as sort of unst inherently unstable we'll see um, I think that the evidence um, on certain areas is that maybe the Chinese could pick things up. Um, but on the other hand, you, you, the, the problem with leaving the seating the field, like for instance, there's, there's a lot of big debate going on whether or not the United States should stay in the Human Rights Council, right? It's a pretty flawed institution, but our membership, in my view, under the Obama administration, made it a better one. Um, if you leave, then it's just the thugs that run the show. Or uh, if you, and if you seed, um, global trade leadership, or if you, if you threaten that we're actually going to walk out of the WTO if, if the appellate body rules against us, as the it, Trump administration has intimated, then you leave it to other people to make the, trade, the global trade rules, and maybe to your disadvantage, well, certainly to their advantage, right? And so th there are real, um, real issues there. I, I do think that as to whether or not we can regain it, that's a fascinating question because it's only been a year, <laughs> right? It feels longer. Um, but it is, there's an element to which, um, you know, we remember we used to talk about soft power, America's soft power, the enduring appeal of its values and institutions. I'm not sure how much soft power, I was, was always sort of thinking, well, how do you measure soft power, right? But it, it seems a little evanescent too, right? You know, it seems like maybe the, the, the glow is less rosy than it might have been uh, around the world in terms of, you know, I don't think there's gonna be as much patience for us pretending to, to lecture other people on, on, uh, on how to behave themselves. Um, so, you know, can we regain it? I think there's that question. There's also a civil war going on in both political parties in terms of how we deal with globalization um, and whether or not we wanna retreat it or not and, and how we rebalance the US entry into the global economy. And then there's a big question as to whether or not we stand for, for human rights and if we do, how do we try to um, try to um, uh, pursue those and uh, and promote those around the world? So, if the lady on television was afraid of our being pushed around, and if the lady on television was really talking about globalization, are we? Is our government taking the steps it needs to take to help our citizens adjust to to this kind of fast cha paced change? In other words, are we dealing with the worry mm -hmm. at the source? My, my, my belief is that, is that she's operating from a, a mistaken uh, premise, which is that somehow all of these things are, are, whether it's international institutions or it's global market forces, have forced things upon us that we, um, that we must escape from and we must insulate ourselves from. I think that, um, and I'll give a shout out to a colleague of mine um, who wrote a, a good book about this, but... Um, my, my thought, at least in terms of insulating ourselves from some of the greater oscillations and perturbations of globalization is that we just haven't made use of the sovereign power that the United States actually possesses mm -hmm. to do things to help cushion Americans from these vicissitudes and to prepare them for competition. Now, it's not easy to do that, but you know, for the last four or five decades, uh, American politicians have been saying, well, we need to have more worker retraining. We need to have trade trade adjustment assistance. And my colleague, um, uh, Ted, uh, Ted Alden, Edward Alden, um, he wrote a great book um, called um, Failure to Adjust. And his thesis is that really one of the, it's not, it's not simply that it's global competition that's wiping these things out. It, it, to some degree, it does sometimes. Some of it's just simply automation and some of these jobs are gonna disappear anyway, right? So, and maybe much more than global globalization pressures. But he says, what we have to do is we have to actually adjust to be doing the things like improving our infrastructure, improving our educational systems, I improving worker retraining and, and adjustment so that people can get new livelihoods, help with labor mobility. And if we can do that, then, then you know, the, the phrase, we can win and compete in the global economy. Okay, we, we, can, we can at least cushion ourselves from the, um, some of, some of the downsides of globalization and, and uh, maybe also do something w about the, the incredible inequality that has occurred that has made people 
many people in the United States incredibly frustrated where they see just a, a very small group of very, very fortunate winners and the rest of them sort of treading water at best. Mm -hmm. Your book, Sovereignty Wars, is a terrific book, so I hope everyone will take advantage of the opportunity to buy it and have it signed. Uh, in the meantime, please join me in thanking Stuart. Thank you so much. Thank you.